My guest today, uh, Congressman Ro Khanna, he's been here before. Ro, you are one of my deepest friends and greatest heroes, and you just keep going. Well, uh, that, that's a very kind thing to say. You're, you're doing something these days that has to do with a presidential election. Yes. Want to talk about that? I'm co-chairing Bernie Sanders' campaign. Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. I've heard of him. You're co-chair. Now, what does it mean to co-chair a campaign? It's a fancy title, meaning that you show up and you give speeches for him in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, uh, and be a surrogate. When You're a super surrogate. Super I mean, surrogate. there are a lot of surrogates around. Super, super surrogate. And, you, you know, I'm helping with some of the strategy and some of the policy. But here's the, here's the thing about Bernie Sanders, which, you know, the, this Medicare for All debate, and you know this because you're a student of history. I mean, Harry Truman proposed this. Harry Truman. Well, listen, FDR. A FD lot of people pushed right. FDR, and FDR yes. said, I'd like to do it. Let's do Social Security, and let's do a couple of other things first, yeah. and couldn't quite get it done. And yes, Harry Truman, and, and, and right through. I don't know a single Democratic president that didn't at least consider doing something. Jimmy Carter ran on it. Mandatory yeah. single-payer health care. And, you know, I was reading the New York Times. They said, uh, how much is it going to cost? And Carter said, oh, we'll figure that out when I'm president. You can't, you can't get away with that now. But this idea that you're attacking single payer, which has been the dream of this party for 70 years, when we know the basic facts, we're spending 19% of GDP on health care, almost twice as much as more, most, other, most other countries, and our health care outcomes aren't any better. Well, I've watched the Democratic Party now for years, uh, even before you right. were around, and I don't understand why Democrats are so conservative. You've got these establishment Democrats, Wall Street corporate Democrats, uh, that are very afraid of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, right. and are doing everything they can, like the last presidential election with regard to Bernie Sanders. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, an old friend of mine, their campaign was not terribly good to Bernie. What's going on with the Democrats? Why this... Uh, why this insistence that they are not Democrats? First, they don't understand the history of the party because they're actually talking about things that FDR, Truman, even John F. Kennedy talked about. Second, I think they don't get the mood, which is we've got extraordinary concentration of wealth, similar to what we had in the Industrial Revolution. And then, as you've talked about, it took the Progressive Era and the Great Depression for before those gains of the Industrial Revolution were distributed. And now we've got concentration of wealth because of globalization and technology. A lot of people have been left out. And Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are saying, it's time we care about the working class and middle class who've been left out. And some of their attacks are just disingenuous. Let's consider the wealth tax. Now, I looked it up. 87% of American wealth is in the United States. 87%. The next... You mean, you mean, it's, it's held, it's held in the United, United States. States. Even though it's held by Americans, uh, a lot uh, of it uh, is held outside. 87 American, uh, Americans who hold wealth, 87% of their wealth is in the United States. 2% mm -hmm. is in the Cayman Islands. 1.5% is in Britain. So this argument that a 2% tax on their assets is going to lead to the fleeing of capital outside the United States is as believable as the people who said if Donald Trump got elected president, they'd leave the United States. They didn't leave. They stayed because it's the best place to live. It's still the best place to invest. But the attacks are coming not from Republicans. Republicans have their own problems right, right. now. The attacks are coming from establishment Democrats. Yes. And so, you know, you've got the, with the wealth tax and the single payer and you've got uh, the Green New Deal and a couple of other things, things that make enormous sense, that are based, that are deeply rooted in democratic tradition and philosophy, and yet you have got a part of the party that doesn't want to move. And my question to you is, why? What are they, what are they afraid of? What are the Democrats afraid of, the establishment Democrats? They're, they're afraid of this theory that they're going to lose the suburban vote, that the suburban vote has, is more affluent and is concerned about uh, these policies being too radical. And their belief is, don't rock the cart. Uh, let's just run on Trump being bad and just provide a reasonable alternative. I mean, that's the theory of the case. For well, them. I... My observation, I remember in the Clinton administration, uh, that was the dominant view, that it was all the suburban swing vote. Uh, and it turned out that it was actually turnout. In other words, if you can motivate people to turn out for an election, that's more important right. than so-called these uh, suburban swing soccer moms and, and others. Why hasn't the Democratic Party learned that? 
I have no idea. And the candidates, even when Bill Clinton ran, as you know, in 92, he ran as a populist. He ran saying, uh, I'm going to help give people health care. I'm going to take on uh, the corporations. CEO pay is out of control. And then they get into office. And of course, you said keep being populist, but somehow they change. And I don't understand why uh, we haven't learned the lesson that standing up for the working class, for the middle class, populist economics is good for economic growth and it's good for an electoral co coalition. It's called, I keep this to yourself, yeah. pretend that they're not out there, <laughs> it's called big money. You're, you're absolutely right. And they come in and they, you know, big pharma has been all over Congress uh, and what they're saying, because we're doing this bill on uh, prescription drugs, lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, but this tells you how the process works. So originally, every Democrat ran on Medicare for all should negotiate with drug prices. Guess what our bill does? It limits it to 35 drugs because big pharma is in there saying, uh, well, this is going to hurt innovation. It's going to hurt more drugs coming uh, to the market. And when you look at the facts, 216 drugs out of 216 drugs were because of NIH funding. And you have an MIT professor who's done a study who says that uh, actually there's a misallocation in the private sector because they're going after drugs that uh, satisfy consumers, if I have dry skin or acne, as opposed to curing malaria and the big public needs. So these are not policy arguments. These are money-driven arguments. Totally money-driven arguments. And that gets me to my next question, which has to do with Joe Biden and also Michael Bloomberg. Yes. I mean, Mike Bloomberg, you know, poor fellow, <laughs> doesn't have any resources, but he's coming into the presidential election. Right. Uh, and then you have Joe Biden sitting there. The reason I assume Bloomberg is getting in is because the establishment has decided that maybe Joe Biden can't make it. And they're terrified reason. of uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. They are emerging. terrified of Sanders and Warren. I'm so terrified that I, I don't know that uh, the New York Times has actually even covered the enthusiastic rallies that Bernie has been having. They, they, they haven't covered the the excitement. They haven't, and he, he often gets left out of the narrative. I mean, he's got he's polling at 18 to 20 percent. It's a huge base. He's got uh, young progressive women of color, the, many of the squad uh, who's in, who've endorsed him, which suggests that he's appealing to a lot of the future of the party. Uh, and yet, People aren't covering a lot of that enthusiasm, but there's a real concern that Warren or Bernie are going to emerge. And I think that's why Bloomberg got in. And here's the thing with Bloomberg. Look, if you make a billion dollars, fine. But to spend that money to get political office, that's the problem. I mean, if he was saying, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to uh, knock on doors in Iowa and I'm going to say I'm a job creator and billionaire and try to sell that experience and I'm going to go raise $3 donations like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, I'd say, fine, this country, it's a free country. But the idea that you can spend your own wealth to get political office and use that while everyone else is going to have to knock on doors, that's what I think people find offensive. Well, it's not, it's doubly offensive when you have somebody in the White House who is a faux populist, who right. says that he is in favor of the average working person and in fact is creating huge tax cuts and regulatory rollbacks and everything that the corporate America and Wall Street want. Uh, but going back to Bloomberg and also to Biden for a minute, and I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Again, this is co-chairman Ro Khanna, congressman and co-chairman of the Bernie Sanders campaign. So, you know, you are... I've, I've got a horse. You have a horse in this race. <laughs> uh, but let's just talk about, if you look at the polls and you add Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren together yes. uh, and assume that they, let's call them uh, Warren Sanders, just for the sake of no. this discussion. You got many more votes for Sanders Warren yes. than you do for any other candidate. I mean, by far, uh, by far uh, the progressive wing of this party is much more activist, much more has the ideas, the bold ideas, the energy, young people, uh, people of color. That's where. So, what is this business of trying to find somebody else? Yeah, I say right. And the, the, their argument is, well, let's look at uh, who can win Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. My view is the person who can win Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin is someone who stood up against bad trade deals, who's for Medicare for all, who can speak to the working class, uh, and, you're not, and who stood up against bad wars. And the idea that we're going to run a clone of the status quo is not going to create a different outcome in those states. But no. uh, 
but their, you know, their view is that uh, Trump will self-destruct and that all we need is someone who will be uh, moderate. I, I don't think that's a way to win an election. It's not a way to win an election, particularly when at the core of the election is question of power. Yes. Uh, and privilege and wealth and who has it and who doesn't. Uh, but what happens, how, or let me ask this slightly uh, less provocative way. How do you keep the Sanders-Warren or Warren-Sanders coalition together? Uh, how do you avoid, and they've both been doing a very good job not attacking each other, but it's critical that progressives stay together and not attack each other, and eventually that one of the two of them emerges as the candidate. How do you manage that. We're trying to do that as a progressive caucus in the House. So, for example, uh, we haven't tried to make any distinction on Medicare for all. We've said, uh, look, the, the, these are the two candidates who are for Medicare for all. Now, I'm for Bernie Sanders doing it in one bill, but uh, the reality is that they both have been uh, very focused on the ideas and on an agenda of Medicare for all, free public college. Uh, by the way, free public college, we had free high school in 1945. I mean, don't you think by 2019 we should have free public college? And this argument about the rich, uh, the, the idea that the, the rich will benefit, first of all, a lot of the rich uh, go to private universities. And secondly, uh, the cost of getting public college to be free is about $80 billion a year. That's amount of, it costs two years in Afghanistan. So, you know, what we're focused is on the policies and the policies of free public college, Medicare for all, $15 minimum wage, stronger unions, stronger antitrust enforcement, a bold Green New Deal that's gonna create millions of new uh, clean tech jobs, a $2 trillion infrastructure project, that uh, there's not that much daylight on those issues. There's not, not, not that much difference between the two. And now we get into the primary season. We have the Iowa caucuses, and then we have New Hampshire, and then we have Nevada and South Carolina. Then we go into Super Tuesday almost right away. Yes. And Super Tuesday now has California and Texas. That's going to be 30% of all Democratic voters by March 3rd. How do you suppose we can keep the progressives together behind... Warren or Sanders or both, or make sure that they, whoever emerges of the two of them, uh, gets uh, all of the progressives and others, not just progressives, but all others. You know, I obviously think that Bernie Sanders would be uh, the best, and the reason I think that is partly on foreign policy. He has stood up against Trump's defense budgets. Uh, he led on uh, the Yemen situation and stopping the war in Yemen. Uh, and I think he has an appeal to the working class in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin because he's represented a rural state uh, that can win. But I have a lot of admiration for Elizabeth Warren, and I think uh, she also embodies a lot of the progressive ideals. But if it's not a progressive leading the party, uh, I fear, I mean, I'll support whoever the nominee is, but I fear that it's going to be very hard to get those young folks, to get people who want to see change out there energized, and, and it's, it's a challenge for the party. Well, I fear that too, and I'm going to ask you one more time, yes. and you can duck my question, <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. We're getting deep into the primaries, let's say. We're already there February, March. Right. The tension is building. Uh, Sanders and Warren are neck and neck, yep. and you've got maybe Biden is still there, particularly after South Carolina, or maybe Bloomberg or somebody with a lot of money comes in. How do Sanders and Warren reconcile or at least keep the progressives together so that they don't take pot shots at each other and bring both of these candidacies down? So I don't think they will uh, take pot shots at each other. They haven't for almost a year. Uh, I believe the the ideal is that one of them emerges after the uh, early four states. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be uh, Bernie Sanders who will win in New Hampshire and Nevada and do well in Iowa. Uh, but whoever emerges after those four states, I think po progressives will rally around them. And the idea that uh, you will have the two of them splitting votes to hand the election to Biden uh, or to Bloomberg, I think, is a very unlikely scenario because the progressives in California and Texas are going to see who who is emerging, who is leading, and I think you will see a uh, a rally around that candidate. That's why I think a progressive is very well positioned to, to win. And the issue of electability. Now, what we keep on hearing from the Democratic establishment is, well, they're not electable, or they can't actually make it. Uh, what do you say to that? I think you've already said it, but I would like you to say it again in slightly different words, so nobody has any doubt, yeah. all right? Well, first of all, 
the last two presidents we had were deemed unelectable. I mean, no one thought Donald Trump was electable and no one would have predicted Barack Obama was going to be president. So this idea that uh, pundits at a time of discontent and uh, change can predict who is going to be electable, I think, is insulting to what a messy democracy is going to produce. Second, the policies that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are running on are actually uh, less progressive than what FDR, Harry Truman uh, proposed. I mean, they're actually coming back to the roots of the Democratic Party. Uh, and third, we need a coalition that's A, going to excite people, young people, people of color, and B, appeal to the working class. I mean, that's how Trump won. He took the working class from us. I believe that Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren are the ones who can do that. I agree. And, and let me just say, on the working class, I think the Democratic Party didn't just lose the white working class. The Democratic Party lost the working class. Yes. And the real challenge is to get the working class back, which is traditional Democratic. Uh, and this gets to the other part of that standard now establishment criticism, which is too far to the left. What do you say about left versus right, or left versus right middle, or we want a moderate, or we need a moderate? I said, I said, what does moderate mean? I mean, usually moderate means we want someone who's going to be for the status quo. Well, the status quo hasn't worked when you have extraordinary concentration of wealth. I mean, it doesn't take a political scientist or someone in politics to realize that there's something fundamentally wrong when you have the concentration of wealth that we do and the amount of people who've been left out, who can't afford medical care, who can't afford a house, who can't afford an education. Something needs to be done to change that. Or you're going to continue to see uh, ugly politics rearing its head. And so uh, what I believe is Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have an intellectual vision of how we're going to deal with that systemic inequality. It's systemic, and I, what I often say is that we might 20 or 30 years ago have talked about left, right, center in terms of philosophic differences about how much government versus how much free market, but now it's not that. It's not the old left, right, center. Now, fundamentally, it's about democracy versus oligarchy. Yeah. I mean, now it really is about an extraordinary amount of wealth and power concentrated at the top versus uh, everybody else. I mean, the bottom 60, 70, 80, 90 percent who do not have a voice. Uh, and there is something odd about three billionaires now that I think about it in 2020 running, right? I mean, uh, back in the 1990s or 1980s or 1970s, you didn't have billionaires. I mean, we've got three billionaires. We never had billionaires. I mean, <laughs> running not to this extent. Right. And running for president. president. I mean, we, we, you got one in the White House and two running on the Democratic side. And... and and then just being spending freely. I mean, there is, it's, it's offensive to the idea. And I mean, uh, Jimmy Carter ran under the federal election spending limits. And until 2008, people didn't think that money was what would buy you the presidency. You could buy a seat in Congress and the Senate, but the presidency, you had to actually go and earn. It's shameful. Yeah. Let me make it very clear. I mean, for a billionaire to get in there, self-nominate, we don't have the old system where parties used to nominate. We right. have self-nomination. Anybody can just say, well, you know something? I think I'm smart enough and talented enough, and I've certainly got enough money. Right. I'm just going to be president. Uh, that's dangerous, and we've seen how dangerous that and is. And the media start, has to take it seriously because they're going to blanket the airways, and they know that that's going to raise poll numbers. But you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no... What is the criteria other than, well, they've got the ability to go on television and blanket blanket airways? And it's it's concerning. And it's 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 this link when people are looking at the concentration of wealth uh, and the subversion of democracy. And Theodore Roosevelt, of course, uh, said that you can't have true democracy if you don't have some economic democracy. Now, t now Theodore Roosevelt and also Franklin D. Roosevelt were very rich people. Yes. Uh, so we're not saying, and you are not saying, that if you are rich, you there's something suspect about it. No, you. not at all. I mean, look, I mean, Bernie Sanders has done well. Elizabeth Warren has done well. And if uh, some of these billionaires wanted to run on their vision and were out in the cold in Iowa knocking on doors and building a grassroots movement, I'd have no problem. I mean, FDR was called a traitor to his, his class. And he said, I, I relish their hatred. I yes. welcome their hatred. And, and but... What? Yeah, and, and I don't I don't begrudge them their their success. What I begrudge is a system that allows them to have disproportionate power in a political uh, in politics just because of their wealth. And and that's that, I think that's uh, exactly exactly the issue, which gets us into what's happening right now. And I want to we don't have that much time. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about impeachment. Yes. And the consequences of impeachment, uh, because by Christmas it's likely that the House is going to impeach. 
the president. Yes. Uh, that means it goes to the Senate. Right. Mitch McConnell and John Roberts, as the Supreme Court Justice, who is uh, the uh, Chief Justice, is going to be in charge. Both of them are going to be in charge. It's going to be interesting to see how that works, because there's not much of a precedent for if Mitch McConnell says, well, we're only going to do this for four days, and John Roberts, who's presiding, says, uh, I'm sorry, uh, no, I, uh, I'm the presiding officer, and it's going right. to be, uh, I want to take uh, much more time. How does that work out? It's an open question. I mean, I think the Senate will get to d determine a lot of the rules, but it will be uh, undermining, I think, many of the senators' own case if they try to short-circuit the process. And so you're going to have a case where the American people are going to understand exactly what happened. And here's the, the challenge. Actually, you know, the rule of law in the Constitution, it protects people who have wealth and property. If you have a President Trump who's running roughshod over that, think about the consequences if you had someone in power who didn't share your ideology and there wasn't a check for the rule of law. That's what happens in a lot of other countries. So if I was a conservative, I would want to make sure that I was preserving the Constitution, separation of powers, and the rule of law. And it's it's actually shocking that you have conservatives turning a blind eye to that. Well, it's because it's a cult. It's it no is. longer a matter of philosophy. It's no longer a party. Bob, it, when, you, when you had uh, Representative Amade from Nevada, Nevada say, uh, I want to follow the facts. That's what he said. And the White House came down on him saying, how could you say that? He had to walk that back. I mean, how do you walk back that you have to follow the facts? He had to basically say, no, I don't believe in following the facts. I'm going to do the party line. That's the state of... Uh, the, the United States Congress. And presumably the Republicans in the Senate are there, and certainly some of the Republicans in the House, most of them, are there. Why? Because 88% of Republicans worship Trump because yes, they're so afraid, because he has been such a demagogue, able to oh, just blind 88% of Republicans. Republicans are only 25% of this country. Right. I mean, what happened to the other 75%? Well, first of all, the Republicans, a lot of Repu people are leaving the Republican Party, so that actually has made the Republican Party the, that are left even more radical. And in the primaries, which these members of Congress have to face, Trump is by and large more popular than they are in all of their districts, and but, so they fear him. But once the primaries are over, I mean, we're, we're very close to, in most states, the primaries are closed. You can't get in right. you know, after a certain date. Yes. Uh, once the primaries are closed, and you've got a lot of senators who are not running anyway, we're not up. Right. Two-thirds of them are not up. So why are the Republicans, what are the Senate Republican senators afraid of once the primaries essentially are closed or they don't have a primary or they're not up? Why... Are they willing to give, give up their integrity and their oath, their pledge of office and their oath of allegiance to the United States in order to pledge allegiance to Trump? What's going on? It's a, it's a profound question. And when you saw Nikki Haley uh, come and basically defend Trump recently, uh, what's sad is the Republicans aren't just betting on Trump now they're betting on Trumpism as the future of the Republican Party. So they're afraid that Trump's base is going to be the base of the Republican Party for many years to come. And that's that's the scary part. I mean, this is this is he has taken over uh, the psyche of the Republican Party. Well, there's not even clear what there is besides Donald Trump. He right. has taken over the psyche. There is a cult of personality. But I don't even see, you know, there certainly there's hatefulness and there is misogyny and xenophobia and some racism. Uh, but what is there to Trumpism beyond Trump and hatefulness? I'm not sure. Uh, but let's get right to the key question. There are not going to be 20 Republican senators who are going to vote for impeachment. I mean, I don't, right. I, you know, he could he could go into Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and they still would not vote. I think that's one of the few true, true statements he's That's he's right, uttered. one of the few <laughs> thing, things he said. So he's not going to be impeached in terms of convicted of impeachment. The House will impeach him, it'll go to the Senate. Then when he is not convicted of impeachment, what's the danger that, the, that Trump and the Republicans say, well, you see, it's just like the Mueller report. There's nothing to this and, uh, and that Trump does a victory lap that ultimately hurts the Democrats? 
Well, first, I hope there will be a few profiles and courage in the Senate, a Susan Collins, a Lisa Murkowski, even a Mitt Romney, who will vote uh, uh, to convict uh, Trump. I think that will make a difference if we could have one or two senators actually look at the facts. So, uh, and I, I haven't lost hope that we could have that. Second, we are going to have the opportunity to present the evidence uh, in the Senate. And the real audience isn't the Senate. The real audience is these swing voters in Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. And what, we, what history shows is after Nixon... You had Jimmy Carter after Bill Clinton, where I thought the impeachment was not uh, justified, but you had scandal after scandal. People voted for George W. Bush. And I think there is a sense of fatigue in this country where people may say, OK, we're going to stick with Trump, not have him impeached, but we don't want four more years of this drama. And that's, that's uh, I think, the hope uh, we all have. Final question. This is a very detailed constitutional question. As I read the Constitution, the president's pardon power extends to any case against the United States where somebody has really been convicted, except when it comes to impeachment. The Constitution says no pardon power in impeachment. Now, the way I and any normal person would read that is if, let's say, Donald Trump is impeached by the House, any crim crime that he has committed in connection with that impeachment, he could still be liable for and never be pardoned for, but never be pardoned by either himself, I don't think a president can pardon himself anyway, right. or a future president. Now, I think that Richard Nixon knew that, and that was one contributing factor to Richard Nixon getting out before he was impeached by the well, House. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, I, because you read the impeachment clause, and it's clear that the president can't pardon lower officers, cabinet officers, judicial officers, if they were impeached. And I don't think he can pardon himself, but you're saying uh, if he is impeached, uh, he can't resign, uh, have uh, Pence uh, pardon him. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, the, the whole pardon power is a ridiculous uh, compromise. I mean, they gave it to Alexander Hamilton because he didn't get other uh, parts of the, uh, the, the, the Constitution with a strong president and were suffering the consequences when Hamilton had a lot of other things right. But the idea that you would give power to one president to be pardoning in the way it's being abused, first of all, that needs to be reformed. But I, I do think that there would be outrage in this country uh, if any president pardoned uh, Donald Trump and didn't allow the judicial process to play out. Actually, Biden, there are a few answers I uh, agree with on Biden, but he gave a good answer when he said it should be the attorney general independent making the determination of what happens to, to Trump. Well, Gerald Ford is, rem is remembered for little else than pardoning Richard Nixon. Right. And may have cost him the presidency. It certainly did cost him the presidency. And on that upbeat note, uh, Roe, Con Congressman, thank you thank so you. much. Thank and you for your work.